All right, well, we're going to get started today. Thanks to those of you that are here. Um, today, we're going to depart from our SketchUp models, and uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time revisiting those portfolios. So obviously, you know that they're due soon and uh, worth, worth thinking about. So today's lecture is actually going to be on the shorter side. We're going to talk about the covers for your portfolio, and then I'll talk a little bit about output and, and PDFs and, and that sort of thing. Um, but the bulk of today is about getting back to those portfolios, making sure you're ready. Uh, some of you shared your portfolios in uh, the check-ins on Monday. Some of them were excellent portfolios to get started. I'm really happy with what I'm seeing so far. Um, for those of you that are coming to check-ins today, I look forward to seeing your progress. Uh, some of you weren't quite ready to share yet. That's okay too, but recognize that we're, we're approaching that deadline. Um, so we want to make sure that you're getting things done, figured out, ready uh, to turn in on Monday the 16th. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And then we'll get into a little lecture. All right, so we're going to talk about portfolio covers and a little bit about binding options, though this semester, obviously, since we're remote, you're only turning in a PDF and you're not actually going to print it out and bind it. But I still think it's worth thinking about because sometimes you want to chronicle your work. You want to be able to have that portfolio sitting on the shelf and go back and revisit it down the road or to be able to, you know, I don't know, show your mom or dad or your, your, your friends or what have you. Sometimes a printed version is kind of fun. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we go forward. So first off, what fundamentally belongs on the cover? Well, to me, there's one thing that's absolutely critical that you have on your cover, and that is your full name. Let's see if I can, oh, come on. My pen's not working here, so we'll have to do it the old fashioned way. Uh, you wanna make sure that you have your full name somewhere on the cover. I'm showing you here on the right, an example of Alex Holgrefs. And he does, of course, have his name listed right there. To me, it's a little hard to read. I think maybe brightening that up would help. But this also could be a draft because he shows a lot of draft and in-process work. Beyond your full name, you can include other things like portfolio or design portfolio, architecture portfolio, selected works, or something like that. You could also include a date range. Now, sometimes when you're working on uh, a portfolio for, let's say you're applying to grad school or, or something like that, sometimes there's requirements about what goes on the cover, option two candidate or whatever, in which case, obviously you would add that to the cover. But to me, the, the fundamental thing that belongs on there is it has to have your name on. Because of course, this is the story about you. So let's look at some examples that are text only examples. And I've pulled these and I've called these from a variety of places. This one technically has a little bit of a logo on it. But essentially, it's just uh, your name, a name, and architecture portfolio. Now, of course, if you're doing one that is revolving around font or typography, because it's just text, you want to think very carefully about what that text looks like, what the font choice is, and all the details, all that small scale detail. You know, where we talked about tracking and kerning. Uh, you know, all of those kinds of things really matter when we're looking at just this small amount of text on the cover. Now, if you have a really cool signature, maybe that's a cool place for this to go. I would never put my own signature on it because I actually don't like my signature at all. So um, it, would, it would obviously involve having a, something that was graphically interesting. Uh, and this one is particularly nice, of course. This one actually makes sense because it looks more like a web page. And notice that this is a web design guy. So it makes kind of sense that this would look like a, a more of like a web page. It's just how it's centered and, and the way the text is set up. But the font choice is very carefully considered. And you've got a little bit of a logo there. Another example here, you do have the name. It's way down here in the bottom. To me, that's a little bit wrong in the hierarchy. I think your name should be a little bit bigger, maybe flipping architectural portfolio and the name would be a good idea. But again, another example. Another example here, I would imagine that this flow line carries through in the portfolio. I would also imagine that this color of yellow tends to follow through the, uh, the color as well. These little vertical lines 
that divide creativity, simple, and detail, to me, get lost. They look like capital I's. And I think in this scenario, you need to, to change that up a little bit so that they're blatantly obvious. So they need to be a little bit bigger, maybe a little bit thinner, just something that makes them not look like the letter I. So let's look at more examples that have text with an abstract background. So what do I mean by an abstract background? It could be a photograph of your of a model that you've worked on. It could be uh, a design. It could be a pattern. It could be some kind of a watercolor that you drew. Uh, these are backgrounds that you can't really tell what they are, but they lend some credibility to your design abilities. So in this case, um, the, the design portfolio has this kind of laser cut shape that's been assembled. It's kind of a carefully considered model. It's got shadows. It's kind of an interesting take. And it, it gives us a little bit of a sense of what this guy might be about. Another example here with kind of the, the mesh object. I know that's a little dated 2013 portfolio. I think the font choice is very poorly considered on this, but at the same time, the, the mesh is kind of an interesting take. We got the ink splat with portfolio. I really don't, I'm not into the way that he glued on the name. It just looks so fake. Uh, with a little bit of drop shadow and whatever. So I don't know that this is the best example, but it's just, it's a very artistic. I would imagine this person's work is on the artistic side. There's something really clean about this with kind of that grunge metal texture behind. Um, this works well on a screen. So if we're looking at it in PDF format, we, this would read really well. But if we were to print this out, the letters are so thin that we'd end up losing some of the detail out of the letters. Uh, it would be harder to read, especially the, the name and the, um, you know, undergraduate portfolio. So this one says portfolio, and I've never quite been able to figure out how to read it. I mean, I, obviously I can see it, portfolio, but it's just awkward. And I think when you're, when you're getting into this creativity of design, sometimes you think you're really clever, and maybe you should take a step back and say, does this really make sense? Another example here with the blueprint kind of behind. I'm not a huge fan of the color tone of the blueprint, but at the same time, uh, this certainly shows a breadth of technical knowledge. Now, this also brings up a, a point in that I've, and I've actually had this happen in the past. The last thing you want to do is use somebody else's work as your portfolio cover. I've actually had students who, who've done this, which makes no sense to me. Um, you don't want to pass off somebody else's work as your work because it's not the story of you. It's not about you in your portfolio anymore. So if this person actually did this technical drawing, it's a beautiful cover. I think the colors are a little off, like I said, but the, 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 the technical nature of the cover or the drawing that's on the cover lends itself to a credibility of you as an architect, which is, which is really nice. Now, if you just borrowed this from Google or something, that would be a very different story because it's not about you anymore. So make sure you're using your own work when it comes to these uh, covers. So this one actually should have been in the text only category, except that it has this background of brushed metal. This obviously being printed on a sheet of metal and being a bound portfolio rather than uh, a PDF version. But you could do something similar with a texture behind. I like this kind of abstract cover with these triangulated shapes and shadows. I think it's working really nicely. Um, the, the care with which the text has been defined uh, by that vertical line is good. Notice also that there's a, this vertical line is very clever. It's hidden as in the white, obviously, but also in the shapes. We've got a little bit of a vertical line happening there. There's also a little bit of a vertical line happening here. And given that, I wouldn't be surprised if these are the two main parts inside the portfolio, where this is that one third line. So you would have content and text or that this is a flow line that appears repeatedly. So it's a, it's a subtle indicator of something that's happening in the portfolio, which is kind of nice. This example here uses just a concrete texture background. If you, if you were a person that was particularly interested in materials, material science, and how materials were used in construction and in architecture, it might make sense to use uh, this kind of a material background. They've got a nice gray bar that kind of highlights the text in the portfolio, et cetera. Um, and uh, of course, it has the person's name. 
uh, and year and what they were, you know, the school they were attending, Montana State. This person is more into urban design and planning. So showing a kind of a photograph or a, a drawing of, it's almost a kind of a Noli plan of Rome where we've got the, you know, blocks that represent the, the buildings at a particular uh, citywide scale. It makes sense that this would be an urban design or a planning uh, student. This one's oddly intriguing because of the little bit of 3D model. I think one of the things that's that's clever about this is the 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 way that the shadows make this part of the image three dimensional, but by the time you come over here, that's now flat. So you're getting kind of the both. You're getting a little bit of three dimensionality, but you're also getting kind of a flat drawing. Uh, if you were to cover up the 3D part on the right, you put your hand up and cover it, it would look just like a flat piece of paper. Likewise, if you put your hand over on the side, it would look like it was all three dimensional in that kind of white background. This one's kind of interesting. Um, I'm not sure what this person's representing. This would be a full spread where the seam of the book would be about here and it would fold around itself. So it's a little bit of a different take on it but interesting nonetheless. This one has the cityscape, you know, the skyline. I'm not sure how the skyline really represents the, the student or the designer, but maybe they're from Seattle or something and that somehow ties it all together. This was obviously a trend for a while with the, with the skylines and stuff. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the drop shadows on the text in here. Um, and actually for the first time, I'm just now noticing that this is a pencil. I never saw that before. So it's just a different take and a different look. Here's Alex Holgrefs. I think his examples are particularly nice. They're subtle. They've got enough detail of, of a bit about who he is and as an architect with a, with a little bit of a showcase, mostly text, but kind of abstract enough to cause to create interest but not to give you too much there it is folded all the way out now we, those examples were all abstract backgrounds now when we get to work backgrounds this is drawings that you've done that are like kind of showcase pieces of your own work that you end up including on the cover this was a full laser cut but here's, this is, an, is a particularly good example. If I was this good of a, of a sketching person, showing a sketch like this on the front might be a really beautiful way of, of demonstrating who you are. And so in this example, the sketch is, is a stunning, really nicely, carefully considered sketch. It's compositionally well set up. You know, you've got a nice diagonal here. Uh, you, it, the whole thing is just working really well. The fact that it's centered on the page and the portfolio all lines up right there, it's just really nice. That being said, by putting a sketch on the cover of your portfolio, it's also a way of kind of saying, hey, you're a little bit old school. You're, you're not afraid to sketch. You're not afraid to draw by hand to get your ideas out. And that categorizes you a bit. So if you include a 3D rendering, you might be categorized as, a, as somebody who only uses the computer. So you want to think about what that's telling the person who's looking at your portfolio as well. This is a photograph of a model that was made. Right, it's kind of abstracted and uh, over-processed a bit, but it's showing the kind of work that this particular person works with. Another example here with kind of the 3D model that's photographed in the high contrast black and white with the light source. It's kind of a unique setup for the portfolio cover and certainly has some interest grabbing potential. This one uses a photograph uh, of a cityscape um, the red background is kind of, it's always thrown me off a little bit. I'm sure there's a purpose for it, but um, it's just a little bit different. This one is excellent as well. It shows a certain level of process, the way that the, the trace paper is, is laid out and, and photographed is just wonderfully done. Again, it's a very sketch by hand setup. It's like, this is my process. This is how I work. Uh, and that's telling a lot about the designer as a person. So it's definitely a nice way of setting up your work, but obviously you have to be comfortable with that. Here we have like the real 3D rendering setup where we're getting the high quality rendering. And that may be showing that, hey, I'm, I'm really interested in computers. I'm doing these 3D renderings and they're, they're really beautiful and, and I wanna showcase that as well. 
Uh, another example here of kind of the, the abstract 3D drawing or, or whatever, and that being the, the cover. Text with a model background. And again, some of these overlap a little bit. Uh, here we've got, uh, you know, just a model that was made. And this then is kind of that corner. I think part of what's really nice about this is the way that they cut out the photograph. So we're only getting just a piece of the model and the rest of it goes to black uh, as part of that page. This is an actual wood cutout photographed using shadows and light set up. Uh, and I think it's really nicely done. Cutouts. This one's not as relevant for you guys because we're not going to be laser cutting portfolio covers. Um, but if you were building a portfolio in person, right, a real physical portfolio, you could use a cutout as a way of showing something underneath. You have to be careful about what you're showing and how it lines up, but it can be a really interesting look as part of the cover. Now, if you guys wanted to mimic something like that, you could certainly set that up um, in, in either Illustrator or in um, InDesign, where you would, you know, use a uh, basically a clipping mask to clip a particular photograph. That would be the cover, and then on the next page, that photograph shows up. So you could kind of fake it in uh, in the PDF sense. So binding options. I'm going to run through these, even though they're not particularly relevant, just because I want you to be aware if you wanted to go print them out, what your options might be. Uh, we have the traditional spiral bound. You guys have seen these a million times. One of the things to be careful of is that, that it causes a misalignment of the pages. So when you open the book because of the spiral, the left page either is higher or lower than the right page. So if you have something that goes across two pages, they won't line up. So you want to be aware that that happens in a spiral bound. There, you can see it up here at the top where those two lines don't match up. This doesn't match with where this is. So when you open it up, it's awkward. Same thing down here with the lines at the bottom. The comb binding uh, is nice because it maintains alignment, but it's also really chunky. There, you can get a wire comb binding, which is a little bit more elegant. It's certainly better than the black plastic one, uh, but it takes up a lot in the center kind of spine of the book. But there, there's an example of the, the metal one. And a lot of these are this commercially available. You go to Staples or Office Max or something and you can have them do it for you. Then you can get into the homemade bindings where you're gluing them together or you're stitching them together. Uh, I've had students, when we used to do these in person, do these in, you know, by hand themselves. Uh, and sometimes it's the most beautiful option. You can also send your work out to a print shop and have them professionally bind it using you know, traditional binding you know, with a spine, gluing the pages together, et cetera, like this one. So you certainly have those options as well. This one has kind of a unique fold to it in terms of how it comes together. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop with that for right now. And when it comes to your particular binding options, since we're not actually going to be binding it in the traditional sense, we're not going to go and, uh, you know, take it to Staples and bind it, and you're not going to turn it in that way, you're going to be producing a PDF drawing. And when you produce that PDF drawing, I want to point out a couple options. And I don't know, I didn't have this pulled up already, and I apologize for that. Where were we in our previous portfolio? I think it's this one. I'm sorry, I didn't have this one already up for us. All right, so this was that portfolio example that I had been working with earlier in the semester. I'm not making claims that this is a particularly attractive portfolio by any means, but I wanna talk about that, that exporting options standpoint. So right now, 
I, I have some pages that have been set up and I've set this up as a facing page portfolio. So here's the, that page, that first page where I have project one and I have the, the photograph of it, okay? When I go to export this, and let's take a look at this particular page, it's pages four and five. If I go to file and then I go to Adobe PDF presets, high quality print, Let's just put this on the desktop for right now. And I go ahead and click on save. When I get this print dialog box, you can see that I can choose pages. For our purposes right now, I'm just gonna do pages four and five because I wanna show you how this works. Below that, I have exporting as either pages or I have exporting as spreads. If I export as pages, I'm gonna get consecutive pages. So let's do it that way. Let's do, actually, let's do four, five, six, seven, let's go four to seven, four to nine, okay? And I'm gonna export this, that's fine. Let me do the same export. I'm gonna go to file and then export uh, Adobe PDF presets, high quality print. And this is going to be dash spreads. So you can see the difference. And here I'm gonna choose same range, but this time I'm gonna export spreads and I'll go ahead and click on export. So let's have a look at what those two end results are, right? So the first one here, where it was just the individual pages, when I go to open it, right? I'm gonna see the pages just in consecutive order. So I have this page, no thanks here, I have this page, which was my left page, and I have this page, which continues on the right. But when I'm looking at this on a computer, not when I'm printing it out, but when I look at it on a computer, it's kind of awkward because this ends here and I somehow have to learn to pick it up there. Here's another example, right? And then I come over and I have to pick it up there. So it ends up being kind of awkward. Let's look at the one where I export the spreads. So in this sense, I get the whole spread where they go together and I'm seeing it as one. So if you do facing pages, when you go to do your export, I would highly suggest checking that box for spreads. So we're going here and I would, I would make sure, yeah, well, this is spreads right here. So make sure you're checking that box for spreads. Now, for our purposes, we don't need all of the marks and bleeds. So we set it up so we have our, our uh, bleed going around the outside of the page. If we were doing this at a print shop, they would have particular settings and they'd wanna be showing all your printer marks. So let me go ahead and show you what this looks like just so you're familiar with it. But we're, like I said, we're not doing this as part of your exports because it's not relevant. So in this scenario, let's go back to my, this was my spreads. See, I get all of these crop marks. I get my color codes, right? That's all extra information. It shows me where the fold happens. And that all gets trimmed off after I make the book. So we don't wanna have those marks and bleeds turned on. So we're gonna leave those turned off when we do our export. When it comes to creating the cover, I suggest that you create the cover in Illustrator. If you're more comfortable creating the cover in InDesign, that's fine. In either case, Right, let me do a, an example here. We still have plenty of time today. Let me open up Illustrator and do a quick example. All right, I'm gonna do a new document, oops. And we're gonna change this into inches. And this is 11, oops. This is 11 by eight and a half. There we go, 11 by eight and a half. We'll go ahead and create it. Perfect. And there it is, excellent. And now I'm gonna go ahead and create my cover. So let's, we start with my name. 
And of course, I want to pay a lot of attention to my font choice. I'm going to align it to the right here. And I'm going to look at my font choice. And I'm going to end up trying to keep it simple here. Let's go into Arial. And we'll do that one. I'm going to up the size maybe to 18. I might draw a line below it. And that line I would want to be black. So I'm going to change my stroke color to black. And my stroke thickness. So let's go back to properties here. I'm going to do it at like 0.25. So it's on the thin side. Oops. It does not like me today. 0.25. Just tighten those up a little bit for spacing. And let's go ahead. I'm going to copy this and just decrease the size since I already created it. Uh, control C, Control V for the copy. And we'll make this smaller. Let's go to like 10. And we'll come back here. Perfect. And we'll drop this one right below it. Maybe it's like that. Maybe I end up wanting that line to extend all the way from one side to the other. And again, I'm just making this up as I go. I'm not exactly sure how this would correspond to the rest of my, my page, but let's drop this down a little bit so it's there. Right, and so this might be the start of my my portfolio. Actually, it's blatantly awful because these things aren't lining up correctly. They're too close to be, let me open up the align tool. We'll use that as our key object. Let's align them to the right. And that's good. This needs to be much smaller. There we go. Okay, so maybe that's my cover. Ugly as it is. When I'm done with this, I would save it so I can go to file and then save. And I don't actually have to save uh, an AI file. I'm going to save it on my computer here. And let's go ahead and put it in my folders here. Now, under my save as type, there's Adobe Illustrator, but below that is Adobe PDF. And one of the great things about Illustrator is it will save a PDF that is still editable. So I can keep working on this and change it, but I can use that and place it directly in my portfolio here. Right, so I could come up here to my first page and I can go to file and then place. I can find it. There it is. And let's go to oh, apparently I don't have it as a quick access yet. All right. And let's get here. And there it is. And I can drop this directly into my Illustrator file. So we can come in here and I can now have, oh, I should have had the import options. Hold on, sorry. When I go to file and then uh, place, 
we want to show import options right there. And when I get that show import options, it's going to be here. And instead of cropping, we want the whole page. So we want media. That'll give me the whole page. And then we need to make this a little bit bigger. So it fills the whole page. Right there. Remember, we can right click and go to fitting. And we could fill frame proportionally. So we make sure we're, we're covering the whole page. And that's now my cover. And I've inserted that. But it's still an Illustrator file that I can work on. So if I said, you know what, I really want that image to come back, I could go to file and then place in Illustrator and drop an image in. And uh, let's see. And let's say I have sample files. Sorry, I'm looking for something on the fly here. All right, there's a, oh, that's awful. Never mind. Uh, let me bring in something else. Let me go to file place and let me bring in, we'll pick my, uh, final plan view from last last class. We'll drop that one in. All right, so this obviously is, is much, much bigger than I wanted it to be. So let's shift it. I'm gonna hold down shift to maintain proportions. We'll make it smaller. Right, there it is. And so maybe I want this to be right about there. Right click, arrange, send to back so that my text is in front. And now maybe that becomes the cover of my portfolio. Maybe this needs to be a little bit bigger. You know, maybe it's like that. Let's move this over. I don't know, like that. Let's move it up. There we go. So let's say I like that. Then when I go to file and then save, and I come back over into InDesign, I, I can actually just update this file. I can go into my view, or excuse me, window, links. And you see that little triangle there is saying that, hey, the cover needs to be refreshed. So we can come back over here and we can update the link. And now it's going to have that photo on it. So I can use that Illustrator file as I keep working on the cover and decide what this cover needs to look like. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. From there, it's just a matter of exporting and you're gonna get your PDF. The more iteration and process and practice you get with the portfolio, the better the portfolio is gonna end up becoming. So take your time, keep working with it. And as you continue to show it to me, I'll continue to fine tune, really making this a good end product of a portfolio. Okay, so that's what the check-ins are for both this week and next week. Um, like I said, today was a short day, so we're going to end lecture now, but I want you to go spend the extra half hour that you have to work on that portfolio. When you come to your check-ins today, make sure that you're, you're ready to share. If you're not ready to share this week, that's okay. Work on it over the weekend. Next week, I really want to see everybody's portfolio. Their turn should. Uh, that is a full construction. We're really coming to that, that end going forward. All right. So, with that being said, I'm going to stop the share and I will let you guys go unless anybody has any particular questions.